simply inside. Take one, action. architect in South Africa in 1969. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, I'd also, I'd say, let me say that it was not my career of choice. Uh, the days, in those days, you know, one, one didn't you know, I, I didn't know that after schooling I would have to get a permit for everything else that I did, where I lived, where I schooled, what I did. At yeah, the time when I entered, you know, the, the new acts that were being passed in Parliament for education of um, the terms non-whites, and you had to get a permit to go to university. I used to apply to Johannesburg, Witwatersrand University, Cape Town University, and Natal University. All the other universities one couldn't apply. Even, and you know, obviously I had difficulty with English. It took me some two or three years to get used to it. So I didn't go into any uh, literally, literally choice of language courses, like if I did law, I, I, no, I wouldn't be able to cope. But anything that was where I could use my sight and hands, you know, which was medicine, that would help me. In the third year, I then applied to Lahore in Pakistan for a course in medicine. I was accepted there, completed that first year call it intermediate medical course. I came back to South Africa for on holiday, but I also, just shortly after that, I contacted encephalitis, and I was hospitalized for some six months. And short story, I then applied to the Minister of, to, uh, to give me a per permit on health grounds was declined, I then decided to take the minister to court on, on those grounds. And I was then accepted, but not for medical medicine. They, you know, before the court case, they told me, we'll give you another course, but we can't give you medicine because there's only three seats available, or, or rather it was five five seats available for medicine and those are already taken. And preference is given to those students who've done, who've just come out of matric and you have um, matriculated two years ago. I then said, what can you offer me? And they said, no, we can give you architecture or engineering. I chose architecture thinking that once I'm in, in, at the university, I will switch over. Anyway, it was, I, I didn't realize at that time that I was the first person applying for that course. And we were never exposed to that course. And in between, I also, while, while doing architecture, there was a bricklaying course that I applied for. And uh, my documents were torn up, including the check for the course. And it was returned to me saying that you, 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 are, you know 
that the bricklaying course can only be done by white people. A non-white cannot enter, uh, cannot lay bricks. He can pass bricks onto the bricklayer, but he cannot lay bricks himself. Anyway, I was worried because how am I going to do architecture? And you know, I might not even be able to supervise over the white builders. But anyway, life is a game of patience, and uh, I didn't want to make a bigger issue out of this whole thing, but I continued the course. Um, I also realized that I had always used to get high marks for subjects that required illustration. For example, if I had to draw a leaf of a plant or uh, describe a chemical process in my physics in Lahore already, that I would get the highest subjects in the illustrations. And I learned something about architecture or rather about life, that this subject was teaching me how to design my living space, whether it was um, working in an office. You know, I appreciated every uh, the comfort level that uh, the comfort levels of life that an architect provides, whether it's for medicine. A doctor cannot live without a house. A lawyer cannot live without an office. So at the end of the day, I was learning about all these other people's occupations. And then the architect realized that oh, the architect is involved in every facet of life, whether it's in, he's designing an operating table or, or a medical facility. He needs to know what he wants. Uh, the first memory I had uh, of my dad at university was uh, when he used to take me to university. I think I was about uh, five or six years old and I used to wait for him on the great old steps uh, till, he, till he's done with his lecture. And that was probably the earliest time that I could, um, that I could remember. Mm, after that, um, I always enjoyed uh, my dad's uh, uh, music because he's too love listening to Simon and Garfunkel and I think I knew I know all the all the lyrics of all the songs of Simon, Simon and Garfunkel also I remembered um, uh, the Beatles as well I think I was probably six years old and a fan of the Beatles so that was something uh, uh, one of my childhood memories after one or two years we moved to 20th Street twin, uh, sorry 19th Street Mm, and that, uh, that was where his first practice was. And uh, the only thing I remember of the practice was he had this huge poster with two, with two eyes in it. And uh, it was quite interesting. And um, his um, lounge set was um, all inflatable uh, yellow, yellow chairs and inflatable red chairs uh, that he used to have in his office. And um, what I do remember is uh, he used to teach me how to answer the telephone and he used to say, um, good evening, um, this is 353970 and that was the telephone number of the office. So uh, um, I think I was with my dad, um, quite, you know, like always good memories with my dad and his green beetle and um, lots of other memories with, uh, going on site with him and I used to hold up the ruler uh, for the site surveys um, and I think it was his first projects in Roshni and Heidelberg where he used to make me stand uh, at the end of the site and then I used to hold this ruler up and he used to take, uh, you know, he used to survey the site. So the earliest memories of my dad were really a lot of fun, a lot of going out and going to see the different sites. Um, and Johannesburg at that time was, um, had lots of trees that I remember as well.
I was able to apply that. Um, I did my own house. It's a house that I said, you know, it was a, a brick house. Again, a brick. I, I, when, when I had received that uh, a bricklayer's course, and that I couldn't do that course, I then, I then, then ended up, for the first 10 years of my practice, I didn't use a brick, which, uh, which came from a member of the brick, South African Brick Association. And gratefully for that also, the merit awards that I got in the early years when I used this brick, they've all won merit awards. Be it my own house, which was, uh, which I built in my first year of practice, uh, which is also the house that I've, this office has been designed with the same brick. It's a, a semi-faced brick, it was cheaper, and our stock red has won an award for them. And Coral Brick then asked me why am I not using their bricks? And I gave them the explanation. For many years I was using this called it the fair face brick in the early in the part in the, in the early years of my career. And uh, we've got a lot of cooperation from the coral brick. In, with, the, with, the, with the natural brick that one, one sees here, in a way, the, there's so much color variation that gave the interest to the project. I was so used to that kind of texture that one, I could achieve with those bricks that when it came to dealing with the members of the South African Brick Association, I was missing that because the general face brick is very monotone. And uh, yeah, what the, um, what the brick suppliers were able to do is to achieve, to get three different colors from different yards that had in a red soil, for example, one of them came from Natal, from the Durban branch. They were some from Ritfle here in Pretoria. And the third one, I can't remember the name of the, the brickyard anymore. But from the stockpile to the bricklayer, they take a wheelbarrow of bricks, just and put it on, onto that heap, brick heap and the next color next to it, don't pick and choose what you give to the bricklayer. The bricklayer was just, whatever his hands get, he must just apply. In that way we would achieve, able to achieve the different colors, three different colors being used on, 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 on the brick. And it gave it that tone, and, and, you know, that sort of timeless tone, I call it, because over time, you know, you don't see, you, know, you, 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 you don't see a one monotone color. It's just it's blended brick. And with that, we, we used it at the mosque. And also, we, we needed to cut it at a display where the, the angle was changed in coral brick for a minimum number of bricks that we had to order of a quantity, they would specially shape that brick. That, that is um, the interest, but one learns all the time. It's, it, 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 one never stops, stops learning. And the building itself becomes an experiment at the end of the day. You experiment with it. And uh, I think the clients um, gain from, from that experiment you know, because they, they get a building that gives them their own particular character and image for the building.
the central foyer of the project, that it is immediately under the minaret, the tower that you see outside, this is immediately under the minaret. There are four, and, uh, four portals. The one area goes to the mosque proper, the other one goes to the caretaker's flat and the visitor's quarters on the right. And the third one, which is on the, our left, is into the administration wing. And the research center itself was the other. So if you've already performed your cleansing function, which is basically you just it's, it's washing the hands, up to the elbow, washing the feet, exposed part of the body, the feet, and the face. This can be done at home, or if you haven't done, if you have done it at home, then you can proceed straight to the mosque. If you haven't, then you, you would come and sit on this stool, and it's all been worked out so that when the tap is functioning, you can reach. Your feet are kept apart and the water dripping will drop into the bowl. The bowl itself has been designed almost 60 years ago by our office and that is for the foot washing. You can rest your feet here or on the side and you just turn around, stand up. The, 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 the globes itself. It was an, I attended an auction. It was in, in Johannesburg. A light fitting company was closing down. It was an it Italian company it was closing down. And among the stock of lights was this one here. They only had the, the glass. And uh, I bought it for 10 cents a piece. That is some 10, 15 years before this was built. And uh, this 200 of those globes, that I, the glass that I had. And I didn't know why I bought it, but anyway, it was interesting. And even if, if, if one looks at it column, people would sit, would sit against brickwork. They would sit against columns. But there's, you know, and normally when people sit, their, call it, their hair would touch the columns. But this, with this kind of natural brick, you might pick up some oil stains or from the hair or sweat, but it doesn't affect. There I've put a, a, a copper band. And this copper guy, he was a quantity surveyor by profession and he had a hobby of working with copper. So I called him in and I said, can you make me the shape of a moon there? You know, and so he, he, he made these patterns he made that pattern, which I call the jailhouse uh, grid. These are, these are, you say it's 99 names of, of, God, of Allah and each one has got a meaning, you know, it would be God, like for instance you say, God the compassionate, God the merciful, so all these are, so when you are sitting here you can read these titles. We are at the fountain on the, on the, call it the Qibla wall. Qibla is facing Mecca. And uh, what's been created here was ventilation for the inside of the mosque. And the planting that is in, put into here is all indigenous plant from uh, from in locality and all, some of them are from Nelspreet, 
but you can see the, sound, the sound of water, you can hear the sound of water, which keeps away the sound from the street. The brickwork, it, it is, the, the, it, it is a, it's a, the facade that's been created. The, the apse which you see in the mosque on the center, that is there. But most of all, you know, it invites bird life. And with spring, you can see the, the flowering of the trees. But at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's the environment that is created from the inside as well as from the outside. Scene two, action. Look, I think one of the, you know, the early memories is like when I came, it was just before sort of 94, we'd bring the pack years, and those economically, they were quite tough years. Um, you know, I know when I came, at some point, there was just, my, just myself and my dad, you know, the, I think the work had dwindled, the, the, you know, the staff had also dwindled, but sort of I slowly worked in, and then slowly, you know, things were improved, the economy improved, um, we had, uh, you know, elections, um, like a new hope, uh, new beginning, uh, enthusiasm, uh, excitement, and slowly then, you know, slowly there's in new projects and new experiences, um, and you know, and it was, a, it was a great time as well, great learning experience. Uh, I think, I think we were lucky, you know, it, it's, there it was basically some small project and then there were some very large projects. I mean, we had, uh, I mean, we even remember working on an airport, you know, working on the Pamalanga legislature, um, some sc like schools, we did, uh, we did a you know, forensics laboratory. So you know, I, I think we could, we could count ourselves as quite blessed being exposed to such large projects. I used to come in, into the office as a kid, you know, just to do school projects. And then formally with my, you know, in terms of architecture, then it was, you know, from first year onwards, I used to come, you know, with the spare time, um, you know, do, do whatever I could do, you just gain some experience. And then when I had to do the, you know, my practical years, then I came to the office. Uh, initially, you know, it, was, it was drawing, and then eventually, you know, like trying to change the systems and work with the systems, learn new things. Uh, obviously, my dad was the, like a mentor, uh, you know, guide. He would show me how things are done, and I would I would pick up on them. Um, and I saw that later as you got used to it, you know, you try and modify what he has done as well. So that's uh, and then slowly I, I sort of grew into the practice. Um, I was mainly, I joined the Institute of Architects, South African Institute of Architects, and started addressing the training of, of architects to bring them, to, to provide for their higher education. And this that form of Black Architects Associations. But, on, but even before that, is to, that the Institute should start accepting more architects and not just concentrate on producing draftsmen with qualified architects. Because Technicon, the Pretoria Technicon, was involved in employing and then also together with the International Union of Architects they came over from Britain and it, it, it was part of, of, of to, to investigate whether architects, black architects are being trained and then and we went from, to, we went to all the campuses it was strange how it was organized by, by the universities that they would accept architects from the African continent, train them in South Africa, but make sure that they don't practice in South Africa, they would practice elsewhere. Uh, with um, architects 
coming over during the boom days of of um, the Carlton Center, Standard Bank, and all the other buildings. A lot of foreign architects came to South Africa, and uh, I was able to employ people from Austria and uh, Germany. So, you know, this. But I used them in the early days, in preference to somebody wanting to work with me, work in my office, but didn't want to share some facilities in the office with anybody else. But anyway, those were, my, those were the difficult years, but I, I've, I've, never, I've never resented them for that. I just looked at it, gave them time, and until they had um, understood, and this, until they started thinking freely, thinking more broadly about human, humans, that they're all the same. And, and and, and also always admiring how and uh, admiring the politicians that gave their life that served time in Troban Island and I've kept in touch with them all of them and through Dr. Jassad Saluji you know all, 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 the, all of these friends that I've had in Johannesburg and Durban. Uh, I've kept in touch with them, but uh, you know, I say they, it's come a time now that they have taken over and they are running the institute now. And also, we part, the project that we did in partnership with Kotsum Malake, it was a Pretoria station project. There were many other stations that were. Maravastad project was done. Maravastad project was done, but it's, it's, it started off with Rajbansi. But we only did that planning, and afterwards, where we only studied Maravastad in Boom Street and the Belongre Station. Eventually, we did it as a, a, a joint project. And the project extended right up to Church Street. That means there was an extension. Marama started reading on our reports. There was a, call it a, a freeway system that was put through the middle of the whole of Marama Stad was only a, a freeways, that were an interchange of freeways. That means it was coming down from Pretoria, and that was where all the Spaghetti <laughs> interchange was there. The old Skuman Street and Pretoria Street were free, uh, freeway traffic from western side of the Transvaal. And it is Rustenburg, coming from Rustenburg, Mafeking, and all those streets coming through Pretoria, going to Witbank, and slicing through the middle of the city. We, we managed to stop that, and we said, you know, if somebody coming from the western side of the Transvaal and going through to Maputo, why must they be slicing through Pretoria? Why don't you take them around? In that way, we were able to stop the N4 going through Marabastad and reclaimed Marabastad as a project. But in the meantime, they had already demolished all the buildings between Skuman Street and the two, two streets. All the buildings had been demolished, and that's going to be rebuilt. And then they decided to move to the whole city, or rather the people, businesses upgraded themselves, and they went to establish Fulberg instead. I then joined the Nest Schools, which is the first international or rather multiracial schools that were established in South Africa. I joined with them, I was on their board as well, and we started looking to set up the nest schools all over the country. And uh, the demand was increasing. Surprisingly, the Fawurburg 
municipality say to us, we'll give you land free if you come and open your schools. Again, these, this was opening my eyes to say, can you, that this, this is same people who didn't want to see a multiracial school. Now we're offering, they were offering a, a, a free site provided we opened up there. That is for the, the school, Nest School to be built in Pretoria, Johannesburg region. And fortunately, all the members of the board, and the Walter Sassoula's daughter was also on that board. And this is where my contact with, with, um, with Mandela was released, and um, the whole the politicians started changing. For, and, and what was said to the Furuba Council is it will come there, but the name will not be suitable. So they changed their name to Centurion instead. So this is how the names were changed. So this, you know, what, I'm, what I'm getting to, what I said earlier was that you can change the people provided you talk to them long enough until they have decided themselves that it is in their interest to change. RPS, this is this Teop, scene 15, take two. Um, so, I, I'm the youngest son of uh, Aziz Teop. And, uh, you know, as the youngster, it was always fascinating to, uh, you know, to see what my father did. And I always loved to follow him around. And whenever he was going towards his car, I always ran after him. And uh, I actually said, Dad, can I come? Can I come? And uh, so he always, like, looked at me, smiled, and he said, okay, come. And uh, what was fun about it was, we went onto site and uh, initially there were, you know, piles of sand when the foundations were done. So I used to run up the sand and whenever he went, uh, you know, I would try and go as much as possible with him. And uh, what was amazing as a youngster, I'm talking maybe four or five years old, I can remember buildings going up. So maybe one day it was foundations, then it was a wall. And my father was always in consultation with, you know, various engineers and builders and, you know, monitoring the brickwork and, you know, looking at, you know, what the best uh, design was. So it was always amazing to see what he's done. Um, and I just felt, you know, everyone's dad, you know, actually does this. And, you know, so it was, it was actually awesome to be living through it. And uh, I think over the years, what you do is as you're driving around, you learn to drive, you start to see uh, work that your father, father has done. And um, the one thing about, uh, you know, my father is that he's always been very highly ethical. Um, I mean, the amount of effort he puts into uh, you know, whatever he does in life, you know, whether it's a family or, you know, his work or even, you know, uh, advising or helping people, he's always put, you know, he, he's put his foremost. And that's one thing, uh, you know, I always look up to that and say that, you know what, um, my dad really, you know, he really makes sure that whatever he does, he does it to the best of his ability. So that's, that's been quite amazing. Um, earlier I was just mentioning that, um, you know, like I, 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 I really appreciated my own home only after um, you know I left to study in Cape Town, and you know you, you live in a in a residential you know student residential place with four walls, and when I came home after the first you know six months of being at university, I just looked at the colours and the brickwork and the light that came into you know the house, and at that point I really I really thought wow my father's a real artist, and uh, you know so that's one of the things, and and as time has gone by, um, you know when you travel the world or you go through the country, I start to really appreciate, uh, you know, what architects in general, you know, bring, bring to society. And uh, it's, not, it's not like, a, you know, we mentioned that it's not just about four walls being put up. It's how the building interacts with people, it interacts with the light, the natural resources that make up, you know, that, that how, it's how we enjoy buildings, you know. So I've always, I've always basically appreciated uh, on my father. and. Just as a memory, I remember my father saying, um, you know, so, you know, in, in terms of building, he's saying that he, he always does things and he makes sure that it's done right. Sometimes it might be a difficult decision where people, where the contractor maybe needs to redo something. 
But my father always said, said this to me once and uh, while we were driving, he said that um, no, one might, no one might realize the mistake you've made, but he said, you'll know. He said, every time you see that building, you'll know that you, you, you haven't done your, your, your best. And that's always been his, I think, yeah, driving force for him is that he never wants to look back at something and saying, you know what, I haven't given it my, you know, my, my full capability or my full you know, education in terms of what, what he has learned. Let's say we discovered, I mean, and also I allow them to stick anything they want, where they want. <laughs> and they stick there, whatever they want to learn. And it's a year, we've got quite a large bedroom. room. And that was original windows that left intact, that window. And when I did the addition for the office, you can see it through the corner. So I can see who's arriving at the office, who's knocking at the front door. So. You know, it's the breezeway. You know, you know what, I, what I learned here, creating the breezeway, I used it for the mosque that we saw. Yeah, I see. So, I see. you know, these, these, and, and yet, if you look at it, it's uh, off shutter concrete, and there's no paintwork at all, in, at all. No maintenance. I only did, my, my own office is above this, and I only put in that timber ceiling now, recently, when the winter cold would, would freeze that slab, and I had to put on a heater in my office. So I put in the wood, plus the insulation, stuck it up there. But freedom, freedom here is what it meant to me was, you know, there was a register, it, call it the Transvaal provincial body at the government level, if there were state projects, all the registered architects or engineers or all the professions, there was a register of public works. You, you, placed, you volunteered to apply to them for work and it would be a roster. When it came your turn, you were given that job. Whatever job, there was a job register and the practice registers. And if the project came up, and your name came up and they both lined up, then you would get that particular project to do. Anyway, they skipped my name for some 30 years. Uh, how it skipped, I didn't question it. All I said next year, I applied again. And so I applied again until I, I got a project. And that's the first time I started doing a public works project. You know, we were involved in upgrading the central prisons in Pretoria. We did the Maravastat building and the upgrading in image of the, the forensic laboratory. And for the first time, I just needed staff and there were still not enough architects around. But the one, I've trained approximately 110 architects through my office and they would come from all over the country, you know. I had architects from Cape Town, Durban, you know. they, would all, they would all come to my practice. In fact, any um, non-white architect would come to my office. So I, I've, I've trained a lot of them. Also, in, 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 in practice, in practice, you come across this so often that, uh, and it's all about, it's all, it's all about appreciating the service. There are many people that said, what, you know, if I, if I get a draftsman, I'm not saying this against the draftsman because they've got their own, but if I got a draftsman and he draws the plan for me and I go there and I build it, why should I pay you, the architect, six percent to do my work? So I said, no. God, God, the draftsman gave you a piece of paper. He did his scribblings on it. 
and you gave him his money. It's maybe one hundredth of what you're going to give me. So the one is, I call it a hit and run project. I put that, quickly did the sketch, and I gave it to you. But I said, but as an architect, I would draw it, I would draw a sketch design until you're happy with the sketch design. And then I'll put it to the municipality. And then I'll invite contractors. I'll select materials. I'll tell you what your windows will look like. I'll tell you what your doors will look like. I'll tell you what your floors will look like. Your walls, the colors that you want, the ceiling, the roof, the overhangs, the rainwater disposal, the fence, everything. I'll look after the building, tell you what you owe to the contractor for this month. I'll sign it and I ensure myself that if I have signed incorrectly, you are indemnified. So I pay for the insurance. Surely, he says, man, how long will you take? No, my, my total service will be from my start to a finish. Minimum 12 months, maybe 8 months. But the faster I do it, the less you'll get. And uh, he gives, didn't come, doesn't come back. And uh, messages float around, the man is 10 times more expensive than the draftsman. So in Lodium, not many people give me work. <laughs> but I reside in it because it is a quiet place. PS as it here since six take one. Right. right, we both are from Brits and then we got married and then we went to Lahore. He wanted to become a doctor. So we stayed one year there and we came back. Then he wasn't feeling so well, so he applied for architecture, you know. He applied for but then they accepted him in architecture and that time we didn't know what is architecture or you know like we were still young and all that yeah. so then we used to study and he was working very hard and he was always he wanted his work perfect you know <laughs> and always very hard and then like, I used to help him also with all these projects and sometime late at night also because he wanted to go to Durban you know for some projects printing and everything, then he goes by flight. And I was always busy, then we made it for about 58 years, 59. <laughs> so then I had my first daughter, and he was always busy, busy. <laughs> and we used to have a nice time, and he used to work hard also. What else must I say? He told me used to bring income, he used to earn money with he used to earn, and I was to, yeah, I used to work hard. A lot of weird. I was staying in Joburg, and then he used to go early in the morning and come at night late. And I used to also have friends. Then I used to, you know, we used to do all this invoicing and you know, put the books in order to how to that sewing little. But always, I was always happy to help him also, and I was happy that he's working. I wasn't feeling that he's not helping me in the house or something you know like i feel like he must work hard never should you know like have problem that why are you working so much and you're not going out and all that <laughs> it was getting on like that had a bureaucracy so life went on like that until until my son got architect became architect then i was little, not so busy then i was busy with the children <laughs> you know looking after them going to fetch them from school madrasa help them everything that was life and uh, we were quite happy what he was doing. But he worked very hard and he was a perfect, he wanted everything perfect. 
You know, you won't accept anything just like that. <laughs> and then I think the house, uh, how you got involved. Oh, he mostly he, he would, one thing he what he wants he'll do it <laughs> his way, but it was a, always the right way. But he decided I was quite happy. <laughs> you understand? But because he, I wasn't a woman demanding like I was demanding this, I want that and that. I was accept it, and I'm quite happy with the house also. We had my all three, four children waiting in this house. All the people we saw, about two, three hundred people used to come, used to open the doors there, and you know, everything. Only we never used to hire a hall or, uh, you know, for, just for the wedding, more than five, six hundred people. But for two, three hundred people, we used to accommodate them here. And we used to open the house, and everything was going very nicely. And people used to always pass by, and they used to think, what is this? You know, when they pass outside. It looked like different, but when once they come inside, they find it different. So all the people used to come pass by, they come and see the house. Because first it was looking like, you know, front is closed, so they didn't know what is inside. <laughs> That's all I can say. Is it all right? That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.